A. It's Geotox. It's they probably have to still. It is. It is. Is he, is he introducing him now or something? No, no, he's just. He's not talking. No, he's just doing the screen. But he's not quite ready. Yeah. That's basically what happened. Doctor of Philosophy and Paleontology. And that guy's not talking yet. No, they're all sitting waiting. There is your mute. You keep it mute like that. Unless you want to talk, then you go. No, there. I don't want to talk. Then. Anyway, so he, you can see him because he's got his camera on. Yeah. Okay. So he can hear us talking, can he? No. No. You're muted. It was mute. And he will. Start video, here you go. Oh. You can hear you talking. Please, can you mute? Here we go. Okay, ladies and gents, thank you for joining us. Before I thank you, I need to make sure that you can hear me. Can someone give me a, a thumbs up in the in the Zoom call if you can hear me. Loud and clear. I didn't see the green bar, that's why I'm asking. Was working earlier. There it's we working go. Up. I can hear you well. Thumbs up. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> Just making sure we've had examples before where we've spoken for like 20 minutes and we've been on mute. So <laughs> that wouldn't be a good way to start. So, welcome everybody. It's good to see some people in the room. And I encourage anyone, especially online, to come and join us in the room because we have drinks and we will have chips in the future. Uh, so, please come and join us and socialize. And we'll try afterwards to have a bit more. Uh, of socialization either here or in, in the room upstairs um, but thank you for joining us online as well it's good to to see you all and hopefully we can get back to really normal geo talks as someone said a little bit earlier so today i have the great pleasure of uh, uh, introducing a newly minted doctor Pandisa Mbuni. that's always exciting to have people pre present who have just got their doctorate uh, and he's currently a postdoctoral fellow in Genus, which is the Center of Excellence uh, in Paleo Sciences um, in the ESI. So it's wonderful to have you. He did his PhD here at WITS, but before that studied at Rhodes and UP. And his MSc was on uh, biological controls of water hyacinth, which is a really big problem, actually, in, especially in Kauten, right? Maybe in other parts of the country. But tonight he's going to speak about something very different. As you can see, uh, presented up there. So, Sandeepa, thank you for joining us. And over to you. Do this. Okay, um, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, welcome to this talk about invertebrate uh, fossil treasures from Morapa. As introduced, my name is uh, Sandy Somuni. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I know that some of you would have opted to go home early, <laughs> maybe to try and beat the traffic, or maybe the reason why you are here is because you want to beat the traffic. So as introduced, um, I did my undergrad um, at Water Sassoon University. I did a BSc in pest management program. 
and then I did a BSc honors in entomology at the University of Pretoria, and then an MSc in entomology at Rhodes, and then a PhD in paleontology here at Vets. Now, many of you may not know me, um, but I was based at the Evolutionary Studies Institute. Just click on the screen. Should, uh... Just click somewhere in the screen here. Yeah? Now it should work. There we go. Okay. So these are the fossil um, treasures um, from Morapa. They are in a form of fossil insects. You can see these two blocks, they are rich in fossil insects. Um, and if all of those were to be described, they would be um, new to science. So we have a couple of blocks like this. Um, and here I show you two more. Um, and so it would be nice if I can get some teammates to help me um, um, to get down to the bottom of these fossil descriptions. So some work has been done already. Um, and here I list the ORAPA publications in a form of research articles, reviews, and PhD thesis. You can see um, in the 1980s, before I was even born, there's about uh, six papers. And then in the 90s, there's about 11 papers. And then in the 2000s, there's about um, seven papers. And most recently, in 2022, I added two more contributions. And essentially, that's what I want to talk about today. So initially, I was supposed to work on Coleoptera, but the problem with that is that um, there's about 400,000 described species of Coleoptera. So that's a very large group. And um, perhaps the Evolutionary Studies Institute um, Supervisory Committee was aware of this. So they asked us to narrow down the scope of the project. And so in the end, I worked on Staphylinidae. The Coleoptera date back to the Carboniferous Permian um, age, and then the Staphylinidae are much more recent, and they date to uh, the Triassic and Jurassic ages. And so there we are. I worked on what is commonly known as rove beetles. If you want, you can go with Staphylinid beetles. And so Staphylinidae is one of um, 36 Coleoptera families. And the nice thing about them is that they have a key diagnostic feature, which is having a short elytra, which exposes the rest of the abdomen. So you can easily identify them. There's about 66,000 um, described species, 65,500 being extinct, and then the remaining 500 being extinct. Now, Staphylinidae is the most abundant family which exists in the most abundant order, in the most abundant phyla, and the most abundant kingdom. They have about um, 33 subfamilies, 32 of them being extinct, one extinct, and they also have about 168 tribes within them. So they have a worldwide distribution. Um, they can be pretty much found everywhere in the world except the Antarctica. The good thing about them is that they offer a lot of ecosystem services, examples being, um, being used as natural enemies, especially as biological control agents. But they can also be used to assess the functioning and eco, um, the services of many ecosystem services as bioindicators. And then they can also be used to manufacture um, antimicrobial and anti-cancer treatments. Generally, um, Staphylinidae has a common body plan, but they also have some morphological um, adaptations. Others have lost their eyes. Others have evolved longer or shorter antennae. Others have evolved um, longer or shorter legs while others have become slim without having to go to the gym. Now, they have uh, several feeding habits, but the most common ones um, are predation, mycophagy, and saprophagy. And the group is so large 
that it has had to be divided among four informal groups, the omalin, uh, tiliporin, oxytelin, and staphylinin. This is pretty much what I'm talking about here. Um, if you look at this picture much more carefully, you can see there are you know, some similarities and differences, but you can see the general um, common body plan. If you look, for example, at this aleocarini, you can agree that it's, it resembles the trichophony here. Another example is this osteteni, it resembles oxyporini. Another example is this psilafini resembles the sky mini. Okay, the last example maybe would be the oxytelini resembling flocarini and pistini. So you can see that there's a lot to tease apart and to try and figure out. Um, so perhaps if you've seen me in the corridor looking stressed, miserable, looking like I'm giving up on life, you can see why I had that problem. Now, the Orapa Dam on mine um, is situated um, 240 kilometers due west on Francis, Francis Town. It's a bilobed hemolytic pipe. It is a north and a south pipe. It's actually not very special because it's one of 60 chemolytic pipes in the area. And so it's known to have an oval shape um, being 1,600 in length and 1,000 meters in width. So it's known to have a flat topography, which is thought to have um, enhanced the volcanic eruption. And then research has shown that the eruption was caused by um, rocks of the arcane basement overlaid by um, volcanic and sedimentary rocks of the Permian Jurassic Karoo supergroup. And then the infilling is thought to have been through pyroclastic debris and fine grain sediments. Now, also, research has shown that the cone of the volcano was um, about 114 meters. And then in depth, it was about 140 meters. And then the infilling of pyroclastic debris and fine grain sediments could go up to between 60 and 90 meters. And for us, it is here that we find many, many fossil insects and plants. Prof. Marion Bamford has worked on plants and the likes of uh, the late Dr. Ian Mackay, um, Dr. Saskia Waters and several other researchers have worked on insects. So I'm also not special, I'm not the first one. Okay, so that is me and uh, that's me right there. Very young man there. That is my late uh, supervisor, Dr. Ian Mackay. Now this guy works for the mine. Um, I forgot his name, but uh, I can assure you that I tried to get myself uh, a piece of diamond. I assured him that I'm not gonna sell it. I'm just gonna keep it. I just want to keep it. That didn't work. And then I thought I should try from one black man to another by telling him that, look, dude, I just want to pay Lobola. That didn't work either, and eventually I had to give up. And instead, we were subjected to four different search stations as if we were criminals. So essentially, there's um, a nice picture that shows the Orapa. So on this schematic diagram, you can see the arcane basement that I talked about and the um, Permian uh, Jurassic Karoo supergroup. We we'll see some sandstones, some shells, and mudstones. And then on this picture here, you can see at the top you have stormback formation, which is followed by debris flow deposits and pyroclastic flow deposits. And then at the bottom, you have your debris flow deposits. And it is here that we find a lot of fossil insects and plants. Now, I am not um, a geologist. And that is as far as I can go with this story. 
So we know the deposit uh, is 90 million years. Um, and we know this because two methods have been used. One involved the dating of the Kimmelite, then another involved the dating of the sediments. The dating of the Kimberlite was done through radioactive uranium zircons using the low contamination hydrothermal process, as well as the fission track dating methods. And they had um, an age range of between 82 to 98 million years, which averages to about 90 million years. And then the dating of the sediments found a free defrites, which is pollen, which are known to have an age range of between 75 to 100 million years. And so they found that you know, the two methods were in unison, they were speaking the same language. So my PhD involved um, taphenomy and taxonomy. And the idea behind taphenomy is that we know you're going to have um, crawling and flying insects, which are brought into the lake via um, water, standing water or still water. So they'll come in as lentic or lotic insects, having broken down the surface tension barrier. Then they'll either be deposited near shore or they'll continue going further down and they'll have to break the density barrier and then they'll be deposited offshore. Thereafter, we come million years later, we find them in either fine grain sediments or coarse grain sediments. And it is thought that fine grain sediments um, indicate um, a slow rate of deposition, whereas coarse um, grain sediments indicate a faster rate of deposition. And then we have to factor in the fact that there would have been microorganisms and water chemistry, um, which would have either enhanced or inhibited the preservation quality of the specimens. So once the geology has been sorted, we then have to look at what we find in, in the rocks. So if you find high quality specimens, which are completely preserved, which generally are good flyers and they, are, they vary in size, we know we are working with uh, an offshore environment. And then the opposite of that, if you find good enough specimens that are broken down into pieces, um, and have a mixture of both the good uh, flyers and walkers, and they tend to be small in size, we know we are looking at uh, a near shore environment. That's the theory, right? And so we wanted to test this at Orapa. And then we came across four different colors. And we hypothesized that the red would indicate a near shore environment, whereas the green would indicate an offshore environment. Then we thought the pink and yellow, yeah, they possibly indicate the post deposition alteration. And so we collected data for all these colors, but then in the end, we only compared red and green. These are the specimen numbers, if anyone is interested in them. And so we measured um, insect taxa, insect body parts, and insect size. But we also measured plant fragments as well as plant stems. And so if you look at these results for insect taxa, what we find is a lot of the specimens were unknowns. But we also found that the red has more of the unknown specimen but it also has more diptera, more hymenoptera, and more blattody. Whereas the green, they had more coleoptera, more hemiptera, and more blocks that had no specimens altogether. And then in terms of insect body parts, find that um, many of these were completely preserved. And the fact that the red had more of the completely preserved specimens. 
but it also had more three-quarter body um, specimens, fragments, um, as well as antennae. In as much as the green ones had more wings, more abdomen, and more elytra, which are the broken aspects of the insects. And if you're interested, there was an equal number of legs. And then in terms of insect size, we found that the, um, the insects were between one and 10 millimeters, which is considered to be between small and me medium sized insects. And the majority of these were actually uh, between one and five millimeters, which is what we consider to be small insects. And um, as you can clearly see, there's actually a, an equal number um, in both red and green. For plant fragments and plant stem, which is to follow next, we had to group the level of abundance into low, medium, and high. And so we found that um, the red blocks, they had more of the low to medium sized level of abundance in as much as they had no plant fragments at all. Whereas the green, they had more blocks that have a high level of abundance. For plant stems, we found that the red had more blocks that had no plant stems altogether. And then the green just dominated everything. And they had more blocks that had low, medium, and high level of abundance. And that was the end for taxonomy. Um, but like I said, I also had taxonomy, which was really the core of my project. I was being trained to be um, a taxonomist. And when I was at Rhodes, I really thought I would finish my PhD in one year. Boy, was I wrong. Because I thought, look, you just need to look at uh, an impression or a compression. You just say what it is and you're done. But I've learned the hard way that there's actually a standard taxonomic and systematic approaches. So I had to examine, photograph, identify, and describe specimens. And so I did this using the Olympus S7 X7 binocular microscope, which is housed in the herbarium of the Evolutionary Studies Institute here at VETS, Johannesburg. But I also used um, the Olympus DSX 110 digital microscope, which is housed in the herbarium of the South African National Biodiversity Institute, SANBI, in Pretoria. That's a very fancy microscope. If you can afford it, it would be nice. So I don't have to travel all the time. Mm -hmm. So I had to view these um, under polarized and non-polarized light, to take nice photographs. And then all the photographs were edited uh, in Adobe Photoshop using the VETS license. The subfamilies that we found were the Stenini, Tekiporini and Piderini. And all these were assigned using morphological character matrices. Now, I did not do phylogeny. Um, that is the work that I will be doing at postdoc level. <laughs> right, so we kick things off with the Stenini. Um, the Stenini was assigned using Clark and Drebenikov 2009 morphological um, character matrix. So you can see this paper is um, already published. It's published in Cretaceous Research. Uh, it is my first paleontology paper ever. It is a paper that I am mostly proud of, just purely on what it took to get it done. If you factor in the transition, from being uh, an entomologist to paleontologist, 
And then you factor in the fact that um, taxonomy is not for the weak. And then you factor in the fact that we had to um, deal with a global pandemic. All right, so this um, fossil gave us problems. First of all, we thought it's an allocarini or a stenini because those are the only two subfamilies that are able to flex their abdomen like this. You can see it looks as if it's about to sting, except it's not a bee and it's not a wasp. It does not have a sting. And so we thought, okay, what is this? If you look at this arrow, look, at first I thought that's a maxillary pulp, but then I quickly had to come back to my senses because there's a maxillary pulp and they are always of equal size and shape. And then I thought, okay, the only thing that can protrude like that, it's an antennae. So for the longest time, I, my interpretation was that this is an antenna. And boy, was I wrong. Except I didn't know that I'm wrong until we went to Titsong Museum in Pretoria. And we had to look at many, many extent staining, many of them. And as we were looking at many of them, luckily, we came across this one. And then thereafter, we started seeing more of them. And then we saw this. This protruding thing, ladies and gentlemen, is called a labium. It's, um, it's a key diagnostic feature for this, for this subfamily. Um, now, insects don't have blood, they have hemolymph. So what they do is they push the hemolymph inside this uh, labium. And so when it's strong enough, it uses that to catch prey, sort of like a chameleon. Isn't that wonderful? But yeah, that's that fixed our problem because now we knew we are not looking at an allocarini, we are definitely looking at a stenini. And it turned out that the antennae for this thing is over here. And again, we, we could cross check this with extent specimens because we found that they tend to have long antinomias until the very end where they suddenly become normal. And so there was the antennae and that was not the antennae, that was actually the labium. And we managed to see it much more clearly once we knew what we were looking at. So we also had to put some nice labels there. So you can see I had to draw this um, and luckily I, I had good grades in grade nine in arts and culture, so. All right, that's enough about the standing. Um, Previously, um, the fossil stenini were described um, in a, one deposit from Russia, another one uh, from France, and then another one in Myanmar. So ours is the first in the Southern Hemisphere. More importantly, it is the first from Africa. Second subfamily that was there is the Tekiporini. This was assigned using Grebenikov and Newton 2009 morphological character matrix. This one also gave us problems because first we thought it's an allocarini again. And that's largely because the allocarini um, is so abundant that some researchers have argued that it needs to be um, promoted from subfamily to family level. That hasn't been done yet. And so that's why the first instinct is to think allocarini. But eventually we changed our mind and then we thought, nah, it's a hyperserini. And then again, we changed our mind. We thought, nah, it's an olisterini. Then we changed our mind. We thought, nah, man, it's a, it's a um, flocarini. So there was a lot of changing of hearts and uh, back and forth and um, a lot of hard work has gone into this. 
But eventually we assigned it to Tekiporini on the basis that um, it has a triangular head. It also has what we call a sublimiloid body form or body shape. And if you look at this abdomen, it has a tapering abdomen. It becomes narrower more towards the end. This one is not yet published. That is work in progress. But I am hopeful that it will be published very soon. Now, previously, fossil tachyporini have been described in two deposits from Russia, two deposits from China, one deposit from Mima, and another one in the United States of America. I don't know whether it was before or after Donald Trump time. That's not important. Essentially, what is important is, uh, once again, this Tekiporini is the first from the Southern Hemisphere and more importantly, the first from Africa. Okay, the last subfamily that uh, we found was the Pederini. This one was assigned using Bobri et al. 2020 morphological character matrix. This one was just purely on general um, habitats or general morphology. It looks like a pederini, it is a pederini. And we simply needed to confirm whether or not we can see the fact that it has concealed antennal insertions, as well as well-developed post-coxal process. And so we found both of those things and everyone was happy. This one was less problematic actually. And I have to say it is my favorite. The Pirorini is also yet to be published. That is also a work in progress. Um, previously, um, Pirorini has been um, described in uh, three deposits from China. So you can see the Chinese love this one. Eh? And then there's another one from Myma. So all the three subfamilies that are found have been previously described from mining. So a lot of work is being done there, that's why. Um, but there's another description from Brazil, which makes ours not the first from the Southern Hemisphere, but it is still the first from Africa. And so the way we've Reconstructed um, rapper is that it has both near shore shallow water as well as offshore deep water um, attributes. And using fossil insects and plants, the rapa is reconstructed as being strongly seasonal, with warm, high humidity, wet summer, and dry cold winter. Um, the fact that we found several phytophagus, saprophagus, and macrophagus, insects suggest that there would have been a steady vegetation in and around the crater lake, and lots of plants for them to feed on, lots of fungus, and, less, and lots of dead um, stuff. So we all know the Cretaceous as being dry, warm, highly humid, seasonal rain and wind patterns, but the nice thing about all the specimens that are described for me is the fact that they all have what is called Bradley or punctuated equilibrium, which in layman terms means morphological stasis or arrested evolution, which pretty much indicates a slow rate of morphological change, which, which is thought to have been caused by the continuous presence of the habitats that are suitable for these. Uh, insects. So as indicated, um, the current ongoing work is to publish the Tachyporini as well as the Pederini. Um, both of them will be new to science. Um, and then next up, I intend to work and describe the Staphylinini and uh, Leptotiflini. This is how they look like. This 
Stefilinini was in McCarthy and Rubich 2005 Tree of Life textbook. It's a very well-known textbook. Um, and then this Leptito of Lini is just there in the herbarium waiting for me, really. And yeah, you can see the typical short elytra, which exposes the rest of the abdomen in both of these things. And so to kick start my postdoctoral fellowship, those will be the first descriptions I make. I'd rather not brag about what I'll do next. Only time will tell. So I started my PhD in uh, late, late uh, 2018. So I don't really count 2018 because uh, there was only four months left, I think. Um, but essentially I've been publishing as I was doing my PhD. So in 2019, I managed to publish my owner's work. And there's the second author. Um, and then in the same year, I managed to publish my master's work. I'm actually the sole author for this one. I've since continued in 2021. I managed to skip 2020. Uh, and in 2021, I continued to publish my master's work. Um, this time I had a co-author. And then 2022, I published for my master's work again with the same co-author. So essentially, I have one paleontology paper and four entomology papers. So these are some of the other duties that I was doing while doing my PhD. I was lucky enough to get experience as a part-time lecturer at Watersasun University, where I did my undergraduate. So I taught uh, insects and environment, crop pests of Southern Africa, and introduction to biostatistics. Once you become a lecturer, you are given many other responsibilities. And so I was also a co-supervisor to Mr. Bongo Musa Kumede, who has already graduated, and Ms. Kumakuka, who's awaiting graduation. I was also an honors um, internal examiner to Ms. Annelisa Leve, who was supervised by Dr. Yekwayo and Prof. Mwanvu. I was a moderator for Insect Structure and Function Extended Program. And since 2018, until now, I continue to be the deputy chairperson of the Sopumelela Youth Development Program. In 2022 and 2021, I was the deputy secretary of Bridge the Gap, which, we, which is what we all know here. I was working very closely with the ever hardworking, the superhero, Priyanka. But it also meant that I get to work with the founders. Uh, Bavisha and Mandy J. So with that came mentorship. And so in 2020, I was assigned three mentees. The names are given there. 2021, I was also assigned three mentees. Their names are given there as well. So it's been a very busy five years. Um, it was uh, very hard, but I managed to find a way. So that is me in many different environments. I think we can all agree that what is common there is that I always look handsome. So I'd like to acknowledge my late supervisor, Dr. Ian Mackay. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-supervisor, who has since become my co-author, um, Dr. Shaw Bedinost. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the NRF um, genus and past, which are my founders. I'd also like to acknowledge the Evolutionary Studies Institute as my host institute. And I'd also like to thank the presidency of the Republic of Botswana, Botswana National Museum, and DPS group of companies for inviting researchers back in 1986 to come over and collect some specimens because none of the work that we do would have been possible without that invitation. And I'm also 
since 2015, a very proud member of the Entomological Society of Southern Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angito. That was uh, really, really interesting and something very different to what we normally hear <laughs> in the geotalk. So thank you. Um, but I'm sure we're going to have some geologically related questions. Uh, so we'll, the mute button. We'll, we'll start with Lou first. Lou, you're going to have to speak nice and loud. Why would you use the word invertebrates in your title instead of the word insect or beetle? I was expecting to talk about brachial parts. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to entice more audience. <laughs> come, come find out when you are here. That is just insects. What did you do you uh, do after your postdoc? I mean, what is your career aspiration? I think I'd like to continue doing both um, lecturing and researching. You want to be a professor? One day. Good. Thank you. Okay, any more questions from the audience online? Just raise your hand um, and we'll, we'll unmute you. Or anyone in the room? Cameron, maybe you can come just to the front so they can hear you on the microphone. What's that do? <laughs> we come closer, right here. <laughs> Stand here. Yeah. Stand here. <laughs> so have you found any bromelites, like fossil food? At all. I wouldn't know how to identify a fossil poo, um, right. but I, I just know about insects, plants, and pollen. I, I don't know, uh, maybe um, I know this uh, Chandelier, yeah. who's a specialist <laughs> in feces, so maybe she can come over and have a look. The same thing, Paul, is that if you've got some poo over there, you can see it's like the, the shape of the poo. <laughs> it could give you in, inferences on the gut, and you could try to use, make that with a taxonomy. This is inside. But we'll check around with the partners yeah. and have a look at it. Yeah. Good nice talk. All right. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Cameron. Any other questions from the room? The question that I have quickly is how common are these kinds of insect bearing deposits? This, this is a Cretaceous deposit, right? Of which there aren't many outcrops in Southern Africa. Is that so? Is the rarity of this just because Cretaceous deposits are rare or? Should we be finding this in lots of places and people aren't looking or don't know what to look for? Because uh, for now, it's the only one. Um, that's why everything we've described is the first okay. in, in Africa. Um, so it's very unique. It's known as a large starter or, or something like that. But it could be just a surfing bias, like everything else. Uh, but I, I still don't think there are many Cretaceous deposits. In Africa, mm. also the Africa in any case, but they, they, we could find one or two more, certainly. Maybe people don't know where to look, like you say, but you know, very few people can identify deposits that can have these fossil insects that we're looking for. Okay, well, I don't see any questions from the audience online. Um, so thank you all for coming, especially those people online, also the people in the room. Um, up until 15 minutes ago, we had a geo talk for next week, and I just saw the speaker pulled out. So, if uh, anyone has a geo talk they'd like to give uh, next week, then just contact me. Um, I'm sure we'll find someone. We always do. And thank you to John Hancock and CCIC for sponsoring the, drink, the drinks and uh, next week chips. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.